Welcome. Uh, we are so pleased that all of you are here today. My name is Catherine. Here's Chris. Strategies, and we're based in Kentucky and Tennessee and Los Angeles. Our job. Uh, Center for Rural Strategy Assembly, and out of that last year, arts and culture, and what that means in rural communities, and to try in this country and around the world. Edge Theater, and all of you. Are uh, advocates and fans I know of Double Edge Theater, and you know it's wondrous uh, place in this community. Matthew Glassman, Matthew, where are you? Good morning. Okay, Matthew has been the person from Double Edge who is our co-convening partner. Whitney Kimball Coe, Whitney, wave from. And part of the rural, which is a blog. with rural artists. attempt to spend these three days looking at the going forward that is and therefore their sustainability just policy makers in the family <laughs> people that decide how you're going to go and support your local community is that a fair assessment so we have a very interesting and exciting panel here today and I would like to just say a couple of words though about the hosting capacity and capabilities and generosity of Double Edge, and uh, acknowledge uh, Stacy Klein. Stacy, where are you? She's the artistic director, and all of her wonderful cast, crew, and uh, group of people. Who for having us here in this wonderful, beautiful space. This is a space that I could only have imagined when I was a young person uh, wanting to be an actor some long, long, long time ago. Long ago and far away in a distant galaxy. To be in a place that manifests so many of those kinds of hopes and dreams that uh, many of us have had about a space and a place in which to work in this country. A few words about the live streaming. Do we need to say anything about that? Yes, if I can just say one yeah. thing for our uh, online <coughs> audience. Uh, Milan, is this okay? The, the audio is okay? Yes. Okay. Um, if you're watching this online, you can email questions to me at mglassman at doubleedgetheater.org or you can tweet uh, at det underscore rural arts. Uh, or you can just put in the, the hashtag new play, all one word, hashtag new play. If you have any comments or questions or observations, please feel free, uh, wherever you are, to be a part of the conversation. Thanks. Thanks. Um, that's kind of scary in a way to me. Uh, I'm not, you know, that much into the social media and the, the modern technology. But I do remember being here several years ago, being uh, part of a panel, and we had questions from Norway, and Michigan, and I think rural Mississippi, wasn't it? <laughs> so we do have the uh, capacity to invite people to participate from all around the world. I just spoke to my son who lives in Kenya, and I gave him the tag, and I said, you better go online so you can see your mom, <laughs> or send me a question, and I'll know that you've been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you that are in the audience, how many of you consider yourselves rural? And how many of uh, you consider yourself rural, even if you live in the city? <laughs> I know Patrice, you were raising your hand on that one. 
And how many of you come regularly to Double Edge? And is there some other question you'd like to ask? How many of you? How many of you consider yourself artists? Excellent. Wonderful. Thanks. Well, again, welcome. Uh, my role is as facilitator, and let me explain the format of today's uh, panel. We have five really interesting and intriguing panelists who represent a diverse cultural, um, age, uh, experience, geographic, uh, gender, racial, ethnic diversity that spans a long time. And if you added up the, the experience of this panel, you'd probably come up with maybe over 100 years, right, Carlos? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think between the two. <laughs> well, you guys, you, the three of us are probably 150 years, right? No, and then Karen may be 100. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. There is a, a, a great span of experience on this panel. So what we've asked is that each of these people has a specific contribution we think to the to make to this panel, and they will have seven to ten minutes to make a presentation about that. We're going to start with uh, Matthew Flaherty, who is a PhD candidate in literature from Washington University in St. Louis, and who, as a co-convener, co also has created the blog Art of the Rural. That will be followed by Stephen Gong, who is the director of the Center for Asian American Media, and who also happens to be the chairman of the board of the Center for Rural Strategy. So, you know, we had to invite him. <laughs> he will be followed by Karen Atlas, who is the head of Art and Democracy. She will be followed by Carlos Zuriana, who we are asking to speak uh, not only of his experience at Double Edge, but of his historic experience uh, coming from South America at a time when things were dicey. And then we will be uh, we will conclude with Nakiko Masamoto, who is uh, from her family farm and who is an agrarian <coughs> artist and who also happens to be the young generation, the next generation of artists working in, in this country. I do have white hair, though. You do? <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> so uh, without further ado and no further introduction, then uh, let's start with Matt Fleurs. Right, thank you, Catherine. How are you guys doing this morning? Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's a real honor to be on this panel, and especially to have a chance to contribute in some way to Double Edge, which is already given me so much in the last couple of days. So I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Um, for the next couple of minutes, what I would like to talk about is really to kind of walk a line between some of the work I do on Art of the Rural, but also some of the work I do in my scholarship at Washington University, where I'm writing about sort of the state of literature and the arts in the 20th century, uh, and thinking about how that engages with modernism. Modernism is often considered an urban art form, but I'm sort of questioning where the rural fits into that. Um, and what I'd like to do is offer a theory of change in the next couple minutes about shifting modes of rural expression, um, and really to offer a metaphor, um, to tell a story on, on some level, but also to really just offer a metaphor about two conflicting ideas that are still present, I feel, in the rural arts broadly, and in our conversation about rural place Matt, and rural culture. Oh, there. yes. Um, so this is a metaphor for two conflicting um, and contrasting notions here. Uh, I'm calling this theories of change from the pastoral to the contact zone, and though those are our two poles in this discussion today. Uh, we're all familiar with the pastoral, whether or not we kind of identify with it as a literary genre. It, in the most broadest sense, is the version of the country that we receive in school and through sort of m many, many art forms. <clears throat> the pastoral is one of the oldest genres in Western art. And uh, it presents shepherds and farmers in an idyllic, lush landscape. Uh, if we could see the second slide here. Uh, this is from, this slide's from an illuminated manuscript of the first eclogue of Virgil. Slide. There we go. Um, so the pastoral really sort of, it, as, as like an, an ancient form, it looks to celebrate the pleasures of song, the pleasures of the body, um, and to idealize the quote unquote simple life of rural people. Uh, if we could have the second slide here as well, I'll show you another, another element of this form. Um, nature mirrors human desire in the pastoral form. 
Uh, you know, we see this sort of scene of love here. This is Daph Daphnis and Chloe uh, from a French painter from the um, 1500s. Um, we see here sort of nature and, and the erotic. You know, we, we see the two goats sort of uh, bucking up there in the background if it wasn't unsubtle enough. Um, <laughs> You know, and that, that's, that's a narrative that, that has been put upon rural place and sort of dominant Western culture from the, very, from the third century BC. Um, what is also important to note in this picture is we have this sort of scene, this erotic scene, but we also have a landscape behind it. And one of the ways that this genre moves is that it thinks about human conquest over landscape and over culture in ways which I'll talk about in a moment here. So the pastoral began in third century BC with Theocritus. He was a Greek poet. He was really the person to popularize it. There were some other writers writing before, but he's sort of the leader in that field. Uh, the pastoral place originally was Arcadia. And Theocritus invented Arcadia in a library in Alexandria. He had never actually been to Arcadia. Arcadia was actually a rocky, barren hillside. Nothing grew there, but it became this. I mean, if you want to think about a metaphor, there's a metaphor. Um, Theocritus wrote these pastorals in a very coded language. Modern translators, have an especially modern American translators, have an impossible time translating these. They're so rich with reference that they're just hard to translate. And to boot, if Theocritus had read his pastorals to actual Arcadians, they would not have understood them. So there's the pastoral. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. There's one other element to the pastoral that I think is worth noting here is one sort of metaphor that we have to deal with as rural artists and rural artists project their anxieties Virgil with two shepherds meeting. Notice how the castle is in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not, I think oftentimes, even if we look at contemporary sort of images of the countryside, we imagine that there is some sort of overseeing power looking down on the space. Um, so the pastoral became a mode for empire, basically. Um, Arcadia came in to, st to stand for the anxieties and the romanticisms of Rome, of Greece, and we can just kind of keep on going on from Western empire to Western empire. And most importantly, whether it's Arcadia or whether you know, it's you know, my farm in Ohio, it's popularly envisioned as a timeless, stable place that does not move. So as the nation goes through social upheaval and change and war, they look to this place as a place for stability. Uh, it stays the same. Um, and we, we see no better sort of instance of this, I think, than with the, the idea of the country itself. Country comes from the Latin for contra. So we figure the rural as a separate space often, even in a sort of a linguistic sort of a bedrock there. As a separate space, I think as many of us could kind of empathize and recognize with, it's used in two ways. We have this pastoral, a paradise, a rural paradise, but also more recently, I think in the 20th century, it becomes an anti-pastoral wasteland. And these are the two ways, oftentimes, that we see rural culture represented in, certainly in the mainstream media. It is a romantic getaway, or it's a scene you know, of social, um, so all, all, all forms of social, social conflict, from, from meth and so on. Um, and that's, that's a bind that exists from, from Theocritus on to us now. Um, so it becomes a shorthand for how to really distort and dehumanize rural culture on some level, even if it's well-meaning, and I think that's important to note. Uh, and it offers rationalizations that legitimize everything, if we went back to that second slide, from colonialism and genocide and manifest destiny down to its contemporary forms, mountaintop removal, strip mining, fracking, some things that are happening in my region. The rural as a separate place, because it's a separate place, we're allowed to do those things to it. We don't hear from that culture. Maybe we think about it when we're throwing something away, but beyond that, it's a separate, silent, stable place. Um, I wanted to sort of make a transition here. If that's a lineage that we inherit as, as artists and, and as thinkers and as people. Uh, Sorry. I think we still have a wood problem hearing you in the back. Okay, should I just move the microphone? No, it's not the microphone. Project. Project, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the, the good thing is that the 20th century, we began to see some change with that. It's really the first century where rural-born artists begin to actually question the pastoral form. Uh, and I, I think we all probably have examples of that sort of experience and that coming about. I think mostly through, you know, through technology, through increased access to education, through community organizing. A shift that took two, two millennia to break began to break at that point. And I think what we see there is a quality of experience that we're experiencing now, and it's on view here at Double Edge, of boundary crossing, of aesthetics that are based on a process of exchange, on a transmission of ideas, 
across cultures, across geographies, across disciplines. And I think really importantly, and this is on display in the Odyssey so beautifully, even across historical and cultural moments, we're beginning to tell our own narrative about rural space that perhaps wasn't told before. So it's a moment, I think, if we're thinking about crisis change and opportunity, it's a moment for great opportunity. So if we have the pastoral as something that we're coming from, I think we have a new metaphor for all of us to think about, and that would be the next slide, I believe. That's the idea of the contact zone. And this was coined by Mary Louise Pratt, who is an anthropologist who works predominantly in South America, I believe. And she said that the contact zone is a social space where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other. And I'm playing a little fast and loose with this idea of the contact zone. But what I like about this is the notion that we're meeting in a space that has changed and we're negotiating new narratives for ourselves, which, as we, we talk a lot about, rural America has changed dramatically and it needs a new narrative. Um, and what's important about the contact zone, it's very different from the pastoral, is that it all happens with the particulars of local place and culture. We begin from that point and we move forward creating, creating our narratives and creating the stories that we tell to ourselves. I'd like us just to focus for a moment. We're thinking about our opportunity as thinkers and artists here. To look at how, how uh, Dr. Pratt frames the, the, con the con contact zone, she said this, that we live, they live among us every day in the transnationalized metropolis of the United States and are becoming more widely visible, more pressing, more decipherable to those who once would have ignored them in defense of a stable, centered sense of knowledge in reality. That stable, centered sense is the pastoral. I mean, that's what we're working through now. Um, and what I think is beautiful, she wrote this in 1991. The internet is a very different force now, and we have a different narrative about rural culture. Rural culture is transnationalized. I mean, we have an opportunity here to really say some new important things. Uh, what I'd just like to conclude with is that note of opportunity and what the contact zone can give us. And if I could just have the final slide there, please. Um, Pratt isolates a number of what she calls the arts. These are the positive benefits that we have in terms of community change mm -hmm. and in terms of art making that happen in the contact zone, in that space where we meet within a community and really think in a new way about what, what, compri what, what composes our, ourselves. Uh, we, and we see auto-ethnography, transculturation critique, all of these parody. I think just as an aside, I think maybe we need more parody in the rural arts. We mm -hmm. can work on that. Uh, and vernacular expression, what I think is extraordinarily important as well. Um, I don't have an example of the contact zone for you because we're sitting in one right now. You know, and maybe we came into this room not necessarily thinking of it that way, but we're in a space where all of these things are happening. I mean, Double Edge, the living culture of Double Edge really fosters something like a contact zone, which I think is so beautiful. And it's wonderful that we have a physical emanation of it right here. Um, what I would just sort of say as we think about other opportunities is that we have an online contact zone that's certainly developing right now as folks are, are watching us online as well. They're part of this contact zone. I mean, this community is beyond sort of physical borders as well. Uh, new media and this sort of philosophy of sort of the, the open source, I feel is a next wave in terms of how we talk about the contact zone and how we make real change. Um, what I would just like to say just as a concluding remark is with all of this and you know, with the important points that we have up here, we still need to make art that can transcend social context. And I think that's another thing that Double Edge does so fantastically well. We saw that in the Odyssey last night, uh, that these are all tools for us to transcend ourselves and tra to transport ourselves in, in the ways that we do in our mediums and our fields. Um, so we see, just in, in, in conclusion here, the contact zone is not a place where urban attitudes are imposed on rural place or rural culture. And it's not about rural people creating a simulated environment based on the whims and the desires of folks from outside their community. Instead, it's about people working through a process of engagement. Process is the metaphor there uh, in, within a particular place and opening up a space for urban and international dialogue. And I think importantly, putting the past and the present into a new context and bringing all of these traditions together in conversation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Stephen Gong. I'm the, uh, as you heard, the executive director of the Center for Asian American Media. We're located in San Francisco. We're a public media nonprofit. We produce documentary film, a little bit louder. We produce documentary film for public television. We also have a film festival each year. We show works of all types, documentary as well as narrative, short and long form. And we're, we were founded on the premise of, uh, and maybe we'll go to the PowerPoint now, and 
I'll just have 14 or 15 slides that just contextualize the work we do at the Center for Asian American Media, but it'll be a springboard just so that I won't, so you'll know where I'm coming from and my other kind of comments. Good, why don't we go ahead. We were founded 32 years ago, and it was the time of a lot of uh, civil rights movements, uh, and certainly it was the birth of what we now kind of know as the, the creation of the, of the Asian American consciousness and community. And it was, uh, next slide please. Yeah, uh, we're part of the American landscape, and we've got over two centuries you know, on this continent, and we helped build the West, and uh, we now comprise, we're the fastest growing minority uh, group in the United States. We're now 5% of the population. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our home, and, and you can see that our mission is to present stories that convey the richness and diversity of Asian American experiences to the broadest audience possible. And that part is kind of key, is how you take the particular experience and then share it broadly. It isn't just for Asian Americans, but our founding is to give the Asian Americans an authentic voice in what our own history has been because there has been an absence of that in mainstream media. Uh, next slide. So uh, we do our work in public television. We have a film festival. We distribute films to schools and libraries. And for the past six years, we've started to move into digital media. And that is also something that I'll want to touch upon. And it builds on what Matthew brought up. OK, next slide. Uh, incidentally, the, the, the image before was of Mimua, who some of you may know, or you know Mimua. She was the first uh, Hmong American to be uh, elected to a statewide office in the state of Minnesota. And she's now the director of the Center for Asian American Justice and represents one of our newest Asian American communities. And that's something we could also sort of talk about, how uh, the nature of the Asian American community has changed and continues to change. So we were found on this notion of, of filling in a void in media and being responsible ourselves for our own uh, representation. Uh, this is a young Cambodian American uh, named uh, who, who assumed the name Don Bonus, and right when the first uh, portable video cameras were available, we gave it to him, and he documented his senior year in high school in San Francisco, and it was a remarkable window on the, the hard experience of uh, Cambodian Americans, and, and indeed it's been replicated. Any of the refugee communities of wars, and unfortunately wars that have all been started or led by the United States has spawned a, a lot of refugee communities in America, and we'll still see that process happening. And, and increasingly, as you know, a lot of these communities are finding their way into rural America. And so let me just stop and say there's a real split here. You have some uh, Asian Americans who are, you know, third to five generations old in this country as I am, and we can't speak uh, the language of our ethnicities any longer. We're very Americanized, but you, of course, have uh, several million uh, people who are very much experiencing um, contemporary American culture for the very first time, and they have a deep sense of isolation oftentimes. Uh, next slide, please. We'd make documentaries about, and increasingly one of the things about the Asian American community is our presence in more public realms of the United States. This was the first Congress, Asian American Congresswoman in the country, Patsy Mink. And she's very important if, for those of you who uh, are feminists because she created Title IX and uh, was a very, very important person for, for all of us, for our marginalized communities. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, one of our recent documentaries uh, was about this gentleman. He is a, was a principal in an uh, experimental charter school uh, for science and math in the Bronx, New York. Uh, he... He left a lucrative career in uh, retail marketing to become a high school principal. And we found in the documentary we did, it also speaks to an increased kind of role of Asian Americans to not just look inward to their communities, but to help uh, you know, be part of uh, social change, cultural change, and education for the broad mainstream. OK, next slide, please. Uh, this was a documentary we did about a Korean-American adoptee, and I think this touches on many different kinds of identity issues. And this is where, even though I'm giving you, you know, the, the two-minute spiel about CAM, um, what I really want to remind, uh, think about when I, why I'm involved in rural is, 
is that those of us who come from communities that have been, have been marginalized and silenced to some degree, I think the past 30 years has been a process whereby we've gained our voice and we've gained a kind of understanding about our place. But the real crux of this time of both crisis and opportunity is how do we move beyond that? How do you start to shift a kind of self-dialogue about being marginalized to a new one where, we, where actually we redefine what is the expected, the norm, or the mainstream? And in fact, how we could make overall diversity part of the real success story of the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is, was a particular, I did want to mention, one of the documentaries we did was about the experience of the uh, Vietnamese American uh, shrimpers and boat people uh, in their experience in post-Katrina New Orleans. Uh, this was a wonderful documentary about how they reclaimed their community after the city of New Orleans decided to put all of the toxic uh, land, you know, um, wreckage from Katrina into the dump, which is uh, located right next to their community and they fought it and that site was relocated. And what that's telling is actually a, uh, this is a community that could not rely on the US government systems of support after Katrina, FEMA. They did not access FEMA, they didn't trust it. Instead, they were, uh, their forms of immediate relief were developed out of their own community. But in this next process, it was in the following two years afterwards, where they really learned how to become energized American citizens, and they learn to participate in the political process. So next slide. We have a film festival where we convene community in person, and I think uh, as, we talk, as we think about the opportunities of this uh, socially networked uh, uh, age of communication we're in, and there is, this is room for enormous opportunity, I believe, at the same time, I think, and, and this underscores what we all feel about uh, a theater like Double Edge, there is no substitute even in a Facebook, YouTube world for a lived experience of gathering together and sharing, our, uh, sharing one another's presence in person. And we recognize that. Next slide. Uh, nurturing new talent. Um, I, I guess I would just say, uh, you'll hear from Nikiko, so I won't... Uh, uh, presage too much, but to say we have enormous faith, I think, as a community because the next generation is going to be much better and much smarter at this than we were. Next slide. Um, and if you want something fun, we're, we've tried to create apps to respond to this, <laughs> to this new age of creativity and the new opportunities we can have to spread our kind of message. So indeed, with, with a, some grant support from the Wallace Foundation, which unfortunately has since dropped its support for arts and has gone into education whole scale, we created a mobile phone app called Filipino or Not. <laughs> it is a media literacy game at its heart. You're asked 10 questions, 10, 10 figures in entertainment or sports or popular culture, and you're asked to decide whether or not they're Filipino. And, and you're scored at the end. And, and there are links if you want to find out more. So it's people like Rob Schneider or Leah Salonga. And you can determine. And we throw in some celebrities whom you have to say, guess where they're not. But, but one of the comments we wanted to make about this was, in a sense, about a, a very important Asian American community that, that absolutely has made enormous contributions to American popular culture, but which has largely been uh, you know, um, uh, what do you want to say, invisible. And, and part of it is just if the more we gain about our knowledge of one another and learn how to speak to and speak about identity and grow comfortable with it, it really is the best antidote to that outworn notion that we have to have a melting pot America where all of our distinctive ethnicity is, is washed away somehow or you can't be American. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, uh, this is just our, our motto, our tag now. This image, incidentally, is from a uh, narrative film that was made about the internment camp experience of uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, this was the Manzanar camp where this young man is, uh, is seated. But our, as you, you can see, our, our mission are to tell these untold stories and share them broadly. Uh, next slide, I think that might be it. Yeah. Okay, so I, 
I'm about two thirds the way through. I wanted to pose some thoughts about the, the place we're in, and I think Matthew touched on some of them. Cam, we were founded in a um, in the midst of a of a, the, an old legacy form of media. We can now see, you know, it's network television, even though PBS that depended on a system of some 300, you know, public television stations taking a national schedule, supplementing it with some local. But it, that that and a theatrical film exhibition. Both of those rely on a fairly small number of producers, of creators, right? And the notion is, is that broadly everyone else kind of follows that. Now, we, we sometimes romanticize. We don't have those perfect uh, water cooler sort of experiences that the Ed Sullivan show was when the Beatles appeared, you know, in February 1964. It was like, boom, half of the nation's youth got that hit. And that's profound. Of course, we all live in a completely different universe of hundreds of channels on cable, but of course, an almost infinite number of channels when you look at something like YouTube. And I think in some ways, those of an older generation, we despair almost of what that means. And I do think in the space that we're in, it does provide us with some unique opportunities and, and I would like to posit that our experience for in the Asian American community tells you you can actually link up members of your community dispersed geographically and they can share in an experience and they can feel connected and empowered in a community in ways that were impossible. And part of that drive, it could be, that drive that we've seen in these last generations where all young people, and most especially and most dire, so many creative young people, feel like they need to move to larger urban centers in order to uh, what sort of live their personal identity as creators or as members of minority communities. I think we have opportunities in the future where that does not have to be the only choice they make. Uh, finally, uh, Catherine had asked me, and I wanted to mention, I have had about 35 years experience in nonprofit arts administration. Uh, starting with um, the American Film Institute, but then the National Endowment for the Arts, and then I worked for many years at the uh, Pacific Film Archive at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, I, I think in some ways I'd, I'd, I'd like to raise the notion, uh, a practical one, of how do we sustain a movement to create more equitable uh, cultural change. Uh, and part of that danger, it's part of that, you know, seeing newspapers under assault or broadcast television, Unfortunately, uh, something like the philanthropic systems that we thrived under or that we, we fashioned these fields of, and disciplines out of is under profound change, I'll say, if not direct threat. Many, many large foundations are moving out of the arts. Um, you know, perhaps it's because in their own debate, I, it's, it may well be the wisdom to look to more fundamental needs of the social safety net but the arts uh, are, are, are hurting there. Uh, and one of the issues is I think the newfound wealth, the new billionaires do not seem to be motivated as the previous generations to invest in Broadway's for the common good. And, and uh, I think we have, in one sense, we, we don't want to give up. I, would, I guess personally I'll just say I don't think we should give up any of those networks and systems of support, and that includes actually, I would say very importantly, public support that comes from agencies like the National Endowment for the Arts or the Department of Education. I think we need to look to continue to state arts agencies, regional arts agencies, local arts, but, uh, but clearly we need to find a new way to sustain and support this kind of change. I think we're all gonna speak maybe a little bit about the possibilities of crowdsourced funding like YouTube, I mean like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, United States Artists, there are a number of ones. There's a, there's a, there's, there have been some uh, remarkable success stories. There's clearly been tens of millions of dollars that have been raised successfully just in the last year. But you know, being in, in the heart of it and a lot of this is going on in the independent film community, I think there's all, there's this this shadow, this fear, I guess we have, since we're not used to largesse or new, new, uh, newfound success, uh, fear that it's already uh, reaching a point of exhaustion, you know, and pretty soon those, those of us who, every time we see someone we know, oh, they're working on a project, and you donate 20 or 50 dollars 
that you just can't keep doing that. We really need to enlarge this. We really need to invent a new form of philanthropy, I would say, that has some of these elements and recognitions of, uh, of dispersed community, but, but which still invites broadly us to, to see our dependence with one another. And with that, I guess I'll stop. Thanks, okay. David. Yeah. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Am I loud enough? <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment with a little audience participation. So um, I'm going to call out some people. And when I call you out, you can do something to let people know. Because there is so much wisdom in this room. And so many of you know so much about the things I'm going to be talking about. So I want people to know that you're all resources. And if I don't call you out, but you think you know a lot about what I'm talking about, you can also you know, do that. <laughs> How's that? Um, and I'm the director of the Arts and Democracy Project. Javiera <laughs> works with me. And um, we, are, we work nationally in both um, urban and rural communities um, to really cross-fertilize arts culture and uh, work towards social justice. Um, and I realize that I'm actually, what I'm going to be talking about is a lot of contact zones. What you're looking at is a really fuzzy picture of a t-shirt I have that's too small for me, so I made it a photograph. And <laughs> that's from the Free Southern Theater um, funeral. And it was called um, A Valediction Without Mourning. So the Free Southern Theater um, was a theater company that was really like the theater wing of the, of the civil rights movement. And in 1985, they threw themselves a funeral, but this was uh, a really, different kind of, you know, it was a New Orleans funeral. So there was a coffin and people put things in it and said sad things. And then there was a party and a parade. And then there was a theater festival from showing all the theaters that had been inspired by Free Southern Theater. And I thought this was a good story to start with because, you know, it, was di it died and was reborn. And in a panel about crisis, change, and opportunity, it seemed like a good, you know, symbol of that. And for me personally, Free Southern Theater Funeral was like the final blow to get me out of New York City. <laughs> um, because I was so incredibly impressed with how, um, how art and culture could be so tied to social movement building. And I wanted to know more. And at the same time, the Alliance for Cultural Democracy, um, Catherine and Catherine, <laughs> and probably other people here, was going on, which was also doing that. It was bringing together rural people and urban people in this discussion about what it means for work to really be connected to community. And Patrice, I'm going to call you out, <laughs> because Expansion Arts at that time had a big thing to do with the Alliance for Cultural Democracy. And Patrice, you could probably wave your arms through my whole talk, because <laughs> the NEA um, was so important in a lot of this work. Um, so the Alliance for Cultural Democracy, um, the board, we used to meet at the Highlander Center in rocking chairs and um, Alandria. <laughs> and um, Catherine and I were part of it, and we'd sit there and rock. And that was like, again, you know, that rocker got me out of New York City because I just started to feel like really important work that was going on wasn't happening there. Um, so I went to Apple Shop, and there's a bunch of Apple Shop people in the room, Mimi and Mark and Ada. Um, where Apple Shop, a community-based um, Appalachian Center, I went to work there, I thought a year, figure it out, bring it back to New York. Stayed there 10 years, didn't figure it out, didn't bring it back to New York. <laughs> but profoundly changed my point of view and what I saw as imp important work and whose voices needed to be listened to in terms of the national narrative. So. Um, this is history, but it's also in the present. I mean, I'm looking now at Ada and Elandria, and they're both working Highlander and Apple Shop, but also the Stay Project, which is all about some of these really major issues which haven't gone away, which is how do I create meaningful work in my home community so I don't have to leave town to, to have work with meaning and creativity. So I just returned from alternate roots, and it's another one of these contact zones and support systems. And alternate roots is a network that supports artists in the South. And roots started at the Highlander Center. And you see how all these, it's an ecosystem of intersecting forces that start to really add up. So roots started at Highlander 36 years ago. 
And I was so blown away this year by Roots because they're actually going really strong and they figured out a way to be a really grounded support system and peer support. They figured out methodologies that really help you figure out how to better work in community or to, to strengthen the aesthetics of your work, but from a grounded, um, often rural perspective. The other thing about Roots, they've also, um, they're talking yesterday about their new strategic plan, which is really about bringing them back to their original um, purpose at Highlander, which is, is action towards social justice. So they sort of went from the service organization to the activist organization, really grounding themselves in those values. And then the other thing about Roots, I have to say, it was one of the most diverse rooms I've been in, um, in terms of and really natural diversity, both in the membership, but also in the leadership and the board. So um, some of the things I heard at Roots that I just want to pass along, because I just came from that meeting to this one, were um, Kelly, you're here. <laughs> uh, Cornerstone Theater did a really powerful play about all the veterans that are going to be coming back that are coming back and will increasingly be coming back from war and what it means when they're back in their communities. There was a day laborers theater that was talking about the very powerful human story of crossing the border and how we can bring that story to rural communities of people who have been taught to fear immigrants rather than to see what our common stories are with them. And there were, of course, because this is roots, really deep conversations about race and class. So another gathering that I was at, and I'm kind of shifting from my social movement talk now to my policy talk, <laughs> is um, uh, there's a, a group called the Art and Social Justice Working Group. And uh, Steve, I was thinking of them when you were talking. This is a group of funders, but also people who have created these other kinds of support systems like Roots and Animating Democracy and um, Art and Democracy and uh, um, uh, artists change. And we've come together and said, um, what should this new funding look like? And this is you know, both from the conventional funders and not. And you know, we all know how private funders, that, that there are these fads now, you know, and art and social justice is one of them. And the dangers of private funders doing initiatives and getting excited about things and then having to move on and what that does to the field and all these danger points. But we've come together to say, well, what really are the underlying values of this work and how do you create some philanthropy that can represent those values? And that's not easy because there are so many structures and that, that make that difficult. But if we really wanted to look at a values-based policy, how would you construct that? And there's a couple papers out there, and I just want to bring them to your attention because they're, they're stirring up some good conversations in the funding world. Um, Holly Sidford wrote a paper with the um, Committee for Responsive Philanthropy just saying what most of us have known for a long time, that there are these amazing inequities in the way funding is done. And this was looking at arts funding, and one of the shocking things is that she showed a correlation that the, the arts funders were funding very far away from the social justice, the, and that arts funding was not a good representation of social justice, and that, of course, rural and uh, people of color were getting very small amounts of funding compared to urban um, and white groups. But she put this paper out, and it's really stirred up a conversation about equity. Um, Peter Penningkamp is about to put out a really wonderful paper based on his work with the Humboldt Community Foundation that's called Philanthropy and the Regeneration of Community Democracy. And he really points out in this paper that the Kettering Foundation, that Foundation's putting out in about a week, um, what are the ingredients of community democracy and all those things that really make it fertile and strong are things that philanthropy has a really hard time dealing with because it's decentralized, it's not institutions, it's all the sort of de things that we know make for strong work, but um, aren't projects that get funding. <laughs> so that paper, I'm really hoping, is going to stir up some good conversation. So I am, um, with a minute left, um, I guess the, what I want to put out there is this question about how you make values-based policy that's really informed by the social movements I was talking about before. Um, in New York, we had a series of conversations in New York and, uh, and in um, rural areas. We did one with the Center for Rural Strategies that 
that a lot of these folks here are at, were at that really look at sort of what does place-based, story-based work look like? In New York, we're calling it naturally occurring cultural districts. But, you know, places where um, you have, there, there's sources of innovation and support systems and places where civic engagement really happens. And they're built on the local cultural assets and local leadership and self-organized. These spaces are very powerful spaces. So how do we recommend policies that really um, nurture these spaces and allow them to do the, the wonderful things that they do? And I guess a couple last thoughts on that is one of the things that came up in these various roundtables is the whole question of economy. You know, we hear about creative economy. We hear now about creative placemaking. So whose creativity? Whose economy and whose place are we talking about? And let's interrogate, interrogate those. And let's look at the, at the, the multi-layered narratives around those. And one of those narratives around economy is um, that this isn't just consumers and producers. These economies are about relationships. And what are those relationships? And how do we support them? And how do we get this really fertile work on the ground to really inform policy? And so in New York, we have a working group that's doing that and exerting our force and joining our voice. They have a loud voice that says, no, this is what the policy should look like. And I'm very excited about this working group because I think its purpose is to do that um, around rural issues in this country. Thank you. Me too. Um, hot, 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 hot. Coming from a, a subtropical place, um, I want to give you um, a scoop, if I may. It's not part of my speech, but I, when you're in New England and in this area, you're in the snow belt, so it snows a lot. When it snows a lot and you have a snowstorm, you tend to do very little and wait, right? Dan? So you wait. When it's very hot, the worst thing you can do is to push against it, because it will defeat you. So I'm going to try to. Be, I'm going to be slow, and I'm sorry because it's hot. But uh, now you will understand the meaning of siesta, which begins way before noon. At this time, actually. Um, I, I, I really um, want to express my gratitude to everybody here. And um, before saying anything, um, you know, I, as an actor, one invites somebody, like Stephen was mentioning to me, to see inside of myself or inside of this that we created. And you have entrusted that with, with your attention, and um, which is worth it and valuable. So. Um, Thank you. Um, Catherine asked me to talk a little bit, uh, or these five minutes that are left, uh, <laughs> about the, the, the story of, uh, in South America. I, I, I was born in a city in Buenos Aires, but then uh, soon enough I was taken to a farm in the outskirts where um, you know, my family was a mix of urbans and, and, and farmers, so I had the possibility of have both things. I was very lazy as a, you know, a good boy, so I liked to read. And what I did was create these kind of clans of, or gangs of kids that would, I would read a novel and then tell them the story, and then we would, during the course of two or three months, kind of like play it which reminds me that this is what I'm doing here. So. <laughs> Some things don't change. So, <laughs> the, the next thing that I want to share is um, that uh, yesterday we were doing the timeline and you know, I needed to put down there what, you know, what decided me to be an artist. Uh, it was what came to my mind was 1976 was the, the coup d'etat that led to the dirty war. And I was there, and by accident, I was in the wrong side of the, you know, not on the winners, on the losers. 
So I needed to really, with my group of people, be creative about how, to, how we're going to survive this because we are really in the wrong place. One of the things I was doing was I, studied, I was studying anthropology, which was already considered Marxist, less wing Leninist, and so we were all suspected. And to be suspected meant that you would be disappeared in a short time. So soon enough, thank God, a friend of mine who had a, his father in the army and I was a lawyer, you know, said, tell Carlos that he needs to just go away, find out. So I, hide. I was hiding. At that point, all that debate that one has with a family, well, I, are you going to be an artist? Are you really seriously considering to be an artist? It was futile. So I couldn't study law like my dad wanted me because I couldn't go back because I already was stained. So what are you going to do? I'd rather do what I want because I don't have any other choice and because, you know, what, what does it matter if I'm going to die anyway? So just be an artist. So I started doing these kind of like experiments <clears throat> or artistic experiments. And then I dare go back to the city and, and put myself down in a conservatory. And there I met this guy that told me, you know, my thesis will be about gaucho theater. I'm like, what, the, what is that? Well, there's this whole movement that, you know, we could go into one day. But this created the major theater um, activity of Argentina in Buenos Aires. It was done by rural people like uh, Buffalo Bill, but, uh, but different, because they would do Ibsen. <laughs> so it was kind of crazy, because the Italians were there, and they, they had the Commedia, and so it was, it was fascinating. So we went into the Pampas to find this. There was nothing left, because, of course, the military had a systematic, a systemic plan that was conceived in the 1960s. So now let me give you a little bit of a, of a historic frame. This is happening as the Cold War is developing. So Bay of Pigs is not the end of it. It continued. So as West Point and some of the, you know, the corporate world, uh, US being the, um, the National Guard of the world, and then Europe being very, very scared, you know, the Russians are growing, and you know, look at Cuba, and this and that, so the Cold War, started to develop south because all of our countries were, had a tendency to move to the left, to the left. And, um, and we were about to get there. So this begins this, this incredible repression. And in that repression, we started researching gaucho theater. Um, at the same time, I meet uh, an incredible guy that was coming from France and was doing uh, sort of boal experiences what led me to do invisible theater, which were uh, like uh, guerrilla operations undercover. Like we would not say that it was theater, but we would do it in a place like this. So we would stage something beforehand and go there, impact. And the thing was really complicated because we couldn't have our names in phone books. So we needed to be really reliant and develop a, a sort of trust um, and, and tactics to be really fast in, in acting and not just with our art, but also uh, in life. Like, you know, we knew how we were going to get out of the place before we were going into the place. And I, we didn't want to know the names of our friends, so if we were caught, we wouldn't tell. So this is how we developed, you know, the first experiences. Out of all this, we created two groups, um, and, and mostly, you know, with, a, with an anarchist tendency, and, and but we were craving to do theater and, and, and to do it in a way that it, was, that it would include the, all the people that was, were at the time being uh, either silenced or, or repressed and so we did it, and it was very successful. One of them is uh, the reason why I'm in the U.S., because Philip came to see us and, and in 89, when after the, the repression happened and we became a little more visible and popular, um, and brought us to a festival where Catherine was 
a convener to somehow, so that role you, you maintain. Um, and then that led me to come to the US and to Europe and, and you know, I could go on in, in different, uh, I don't know if this is kind of like an, an, an enough of the history. I think that there are certain things that I want to point out. Like, um, there's always a possibility to create even in, in, in very difficult circumstances. And that's something that Stacy reminded me when I came, first came here, like anything is possible. So we're looking at a dilapidated farm and we thought, well, we can do it. And here it is. So um, somehow, you know, I don't need a PowerPoint and I'm very thankful because I think you're experiencing it with me as we go. Um, I think with that in mind, I think that the, the, thinking of, um, the, the thinking about optimism, faith, uh, the leap of faith, um, they're really crucial to develop anything that, that could get us out of situations like um, war situations or repressive instances or refugee instances. In, it's, it's interesting because I love paradoxes. I like to hold them as long as I can. And, uh, you know, in Argentina, I am the, the, the white guy, the dominant guy. I was called the blonde in the native <laughs> communities. They call me the blondie and, uh, because I have blue eyes. And um, here I come and I'm the, lat you know, I'm on the other side. I'm the Latino and I'm the, you know, this is coming as a refugee guy. Um, and I think that paradox is really important and, and it nurtures the art because in, where I want to go with this is, you know, what I think my role is, is to somehow find a way and or create a structure that will support that, that passage for some people to be able to go and hold the irrational. And um, which is what probably I was trying to show last night with the performance. So, this is a moment where I'm going crazy and you're all witnessing it with me. And what the irrational is, after I, I heard all the, 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 all these beautiful stories and I was thinking, when you were telling the stories, I can relate to all of you guys somehow, emotionally, not in the detail, but in, in the deep down. What the irrational is, is that ability or the different tactics and the different abilities to deal with pain. And I think pain is a, is in a, in a, a, like a, a signal to us that death exists, not really like you, you say. But, you know, but then there is also pleasure, which relates to the sex part that you were talking about. <laughs> and our connection between that and our elation is that religion, right? Is to, is to, is to relink again the earth and these terrible stories we, we need to live, like Odysseus, and this elation, you know, Circe, Calypso, even, you know, Penelope, um, there are moments of elation that we can attain for a, a very um, ephemeral second. The rest of the time we go back down and then we go back up, and I think that that's, that's the role of the art, and I think that that is the deep contribution to the politics and the deep contribution to the social change. Because without craziness and without saying anything is possible, my country would have been still in that dictatorship. But because we created the, the movement of theater, popular theater, we created um, the movements of uh, medias in the university, everything was clandestine, but we created and we developed it, the system fell apart. So this is what I think, you know, is possible, and this is probably what, what you wanted me to share. <laughs> Just to acknowledge everything that we're sharing, that we are sharing, 
And I also need a moment to remember my body. So I'm going to invite everyone to do a little chair wiggle. <laughs> wiggle in your chair. Take a deep breath. Can I go for a run? Yeah. <laughs> Come back. I'll be back. I'll be Absolutely. Cool. Honor the body. Take a deep breath. Um, and as you get settled, when you feel ready, um, I wanted to ask, my name is Nikiko Masumoto, um, and I wanted to start not with me saying something, but when we did the poll in the beginning, we saw so many hands of people who are rural, who identify as rural, who have some connection to rural, and who are also artists. So what I wanted to do is start with, um, I wanted to let you all think of a piece of rural art. It could be your own, it could be something you witnessed, it could be something you heard about. Think about one piece of rural art that has moved you, that has touched you. And I'd like you to think of one word that you had that responded to that art or that captures that art. Just one word to describe your experience of rural art. And I'd love to just hear some of those words. Whenever you're ready. Organic. Organic. Visionary. Visionary. Transcendent. Courageous. Courageous. Inspired. Inspired. Risky. One more time. Risky. Risky. Fantastic. Fantastic. Humble. One more time. Humble. Innovative. Humbled and innovative. Magic. Magic. Heavy. Heavy. <laughs> Connected. Connected. Me. One more time? Me. Me. Scrappy. Scrappy. Maybe take two more? Transformational. Transformational. Small. Small. Identity. Identity. Love. One more time? Love. Bob? Love. 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 <laughs> Inverted that. Love. Thank you. Thank you. So we can go on and on and on, but I just, I just wanted to take a minute to locate ourselves in this passion that I think we all share. Um, and as I was preparing for this and I was thinking about what word I would choose right now, um, and that word is embodied. And I wanted to share kind of the segue of, of a little bit of what I do um, and, and why that word is so important to me. Um, I'm a fourth generation Japanese American mixed race farmer, organic farmer from the Central Valley in California. Um, and I call myself an agrarian artist for a couple of reasons. And one of those reasons is because as a farmer, um, I can't separate my artistic creative life from farming. And I know um, Jay and Donna, we talked about you shared this yesterday also. I'm sure there's more people in this room who share that. And so one of, the, one of the ways I've been able to articulate how farming is an artistic practice is through this idea of embodiment. That we forget that eating and producing food are embodied experiences that are always aesthetic. They're always aesthetic experiences. They involve the senses. They involve meaning beyond the molecules which we are consuming. And so for me, that's been um, key to my survival, to my thriving as um, a burgeoning, a young agrarian artist. So what I wanted to offer today um, was just a little bit of the histories that inform my life um, as, as a 26-year-old, um, and then also offer a little bit of a few nuggets of theories of change of, of what keeps me going and, and as, a, as an activist, as an artist, as an agrarian, as a farmer. Um, and so I wanted to start off with um, this idea of a history being rooted in the place that I'm from. As I know we all, I, I think there's so many beautiful stories in this room. Um, and one of those stories, I kind of touched on this yesterday, but I just wanted to expand on it because there's so much importance in, in this idea for me of resilience. And re resilience that takes a form um, that, that does not always look like protest or, or, I or idea of protest. Um, and it, it, might, it might, jumping off of Matt's idea, present a different model of r rural activism that does challenge the pastoral 
um, confining of rural to these two dichotomies, but that might also not match up with urban ideas of protest um, and social change. Um, and so this idea, um, th this, this, it's really a story um, about my family. Um, so the land that I work on every day that I live, that I live on, um, the land was purchased by my Jichan, my grandfather, um, right after World War II. Um, my Jichan was a, Jap is, was a Japanese American um, and was interned during World War II. He met my Bachan, my grandmother, in camp. Um, and despite all of the odds, they fell in love and they decided that they were going to have um, a family farm. And so right after losing everything, right after being drafted, right after losing a brother, um, my Jichan comes back to the Central Valley and buys land. Cheap land because he couldn't get good land, so he spent years blowing dynamite, using dynamite to blow out hard pan from the land, but he, he bought land, literally planting roots in a place that clearly did not want him, did not want him. Um, and that history of, of uh, for me, in my family, and as particularly on the landscape of the West Coast, of, of immigrants of color coming and planting roots in a place that explicitly did not want them, that for me is the resilience of rural culture that I think can carry, has carried us to now and can keep on carrying us to the future. Um, and so this history of the, the, this, this, my, my Jichan, who was a registered Republican his entire life, <laughs> doing the most radical thing I think I could ever think of, building a family farm in the United States, um, that legacy is something that I carry with me every single day. Um, and it, it, it relates to just the nuggets that I have learned from working in, in his in his gloves, in his workshop, on, on the farm, um, and that's, one of my theories of change that I would argue is a rural theory of change is a, a, is a, a sense of long timelines, of long timelines. When I came back to the farm, we um, planted an orchard of nectarines, and my dad looked at me and he said, so in 20 years, these trees will be fully grown. And I was 22 at the time, and that really startled me. I don't know why, <laughs> because I know being in the land, I know this is the place I want to be, but it was this moment of, right, change, social change, environmental change, ecological sustainability doesn't have an end. It's, we, we have to think of ourselves on these long timelines. Um, and, and, and in contrast to that, or, or in wonderful um, uh, juxtaposition, juxtaposition with that, one of the things that gives me the most hope is this thinking about ourselves in these long timelines with, at the same time, this development of digital media and the internet age that allows us to have connections almost instantaneously. And that, that paradox, that contradiction, um, is really invigorating to me, and it's what gives me a lot of hope, a lot of stamina to keep going, um, because our modes of communication allow us to connect with such a multi multiplicity of people instantaneously, and I hope that the, those connections um, are part of building blocks of a long tradition of growth and change. And so those are just the two ideas. I really want to get into dialogue and some debate. So that's all I want to share right now. Um, I want to say thank you again for you all being here and, and giving us the ultimate, as Carlos was saying, witnessing and being present, that, that is a gift. So I want to say thank you. And I want to pass it off to Catherine for the next part. Thank you. Thank you all so much. What we've done now, or what we're going to do now, what we've asked is that we have four respondents that we have uh, asked to to witness and to ask a question or make a comment or think about what they have heard as prelude to opening this up to a broader conversation with everyone in the room. And um, Richard, I'm going to ask you to go first. Sure. Okay. Sure. <coughs> Would you um, stand and introduce yourself so others? Yeah, sure. I'm Richard Saxon. I'm the creative director of the M12 Art Collective. 
um, also a professor of post-studio practice at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, I actually have two quick things, and they're both very okay. quick, so we'll, ro we'll roll through them, and they're actually for, for the sort of entire panel here. Um, well, the, the, the first thought that I have is I just, I want to jump on Carlos's bus and just take us all on a, a mission of craziness, <laughs> campaign for craziness. I think that's probably what we should all do um, to, to uh, make more progress. But um, my first question, or the, the first topic is really about exchange. And uh, Stephen, you spoke of this split between um, sort of between generations in the language and experience. And Matthew, you spoke of this implied misrepresentation of the rural as a separate place, it's both cultural and sort of from the urban. And the, real quick, I want to go down and I want to ask this question of what examples each of you have from your bodies of knowledge that are tra transnational, on the ground, project-based initiatives that are fusing cultural global experiences in rural areas. Shall we take the respondents all first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I need some We're time good. to yeah. make up a lie. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you a question one more time? Yeah. So, can I, yeah. Uh, so the, the, the question is basically fusing the, all, all of that together and saying what examples of transnational, <coughs> on the ground, functioning, project-based initiatives that are actually fusing cultural, global experiences together happening in rural, in rural areas, any, anywhere in the world. Doesn't doesn't matter where they are. I'd like us to know about some examples that, that you all know about through your through your, through your bodies of knowledge. Um, so if we're going to take the questions, in, can I can I ask my second one yes. real quick? Um, and this is really this is really easy. And Nikiko, um, I think we sort of have an idea of your yours here, and I, th and I think it's great. I want to sort of parlay off of that. And it's a question of values. Um, and what we're thinking about when we think about values. Um, I think it's very clear at this juncture that, ru that rural does not mean living in the country. Um, and it doesn't mean Grandpa Jones and Andy Griffith, as we talked about yesterday, or Crawford, Texas, for that matter. Um, and, we, and as we are not moving into, but that we are currently in a post-agricultural rural transnational period, what are the core values that we associate with this notion. Thank you. Good. Okay. Be thinking thinking about that. Alondria? Hi. Um, so I'm Elandria Williams. I'm with the Highland Resource Education Center. Um, so it's hard to say. All right. So I had so I want to say the, this first part and then ask the question because it goes together. Um, at the beginning, when we were talking about the pastoral frame, I realized I wasn't actually in the space, and nor am I halfway on the panel. Um, and <laughs> most of my identities, I'm not on the panel. Um, and what does that mean for how we actually talk about rural art? And let's comp it's time to complicate that frame. Because in my people's art, from indigenous to black to we can go down the list, especially southern, what does art mean and whose art are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to do that. Otherwise, we continue to perpetuate historical memory loss and historical insanity. Um, even if we go back to Europe, right, and, and it wasn't idealistic for 98% of the people. So for me, a key question as a cultural organizer and someone who, to me, cultural practice and art are always about shifting and pushing paradigms and pushing to a new reality. Um, what is the role now in terms of art and cultural practice and actually getting us to a different place globally? Um, what does it mean to have come from Argentina, to come from movement, and what does it mean to be working here now? Like, what does it mean in terms of your work and all of your work in terms of where we have to go? Does that make sense? Question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dollar? Hi, I'm Donna Newworth. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Warren Farm Institute, and we, uh, our mission is to integrate culture and agriculture. And I heard at least three of you mention farms or agriculture or food in, in your talks. And because it's, it's at the crux of what we do, uh, and because we see that that piece of it is, is uh, 
critical to our work. And I would argue that we're not in a post-agricultural reality. I think we're in a shifting agricultural reality. Because as Wendell Berry said, eating is an agricultural act. We are That's all right. involved in agriculture. That's and right. I think we are at a time in history when uh, it's the local food, food movement has energized agriculture. And people um, your age are entering it in, in waves. And we're very, very excited about the future for, for the agricultural. And of course, the word culture is embedded in that word. And I think it's important for us all to remember that. So I would like to hear from all of you. What is the agricultural connection to what you do? Do you think it's important for ongoing rural culture? Thank you. Marionette. Um, I'm Marionette Member with the Daily Member. Um, just kind of want to share some observations and again cite this uh, man I spoken about before, Dr. Fitzsoy, a guy at Harvard here, a geneticist, and he had told me about, after studying, um, I guess he was studying the genetic code, and it was car bark, and uh, he came back home, and he was uh, out in his uh, family's hogan out there in Navajo country, and he was sitting around, and he was talking, he was talking in Navajo that there's this tremendous amount of shared code between the art bark and the human, like 90% or something, and his uncle was sitting there, and the old Navajo man, he was very quiet, and he was listening, and, mm -hmm. and after a while, he says, Oh, I'm glad those white scientists have finally given it. <laughs> and it struck me that this is, you know, that, you know, of course we always, we always got to tell a story for something. It struck me is you guys are coming in a circle here. Finally, you know, the thing I was thinking, you know, the, rest, the Western framework that kind of informed initial contact with this country, you know, and, you know, misunderstood us, devalued us, tried to destroy us. Now you, you're realizing what were we thinking? You know, we need that. We Long for that in the, is a demoralizing mistake. And um, I think you're re embracing us, but how now do you re embrace these silenced ones, as Carlos was saying? And, and of course, you want to create a framework for it. You want to like dice it all up. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, as, as Carlos is saying, it's a leap of faith, man. It's a risky leap of faith. And it's, we have to go into some scary territory, so something really. Um, and uh, to reconnect that relationship with Earth, maybe is not maybe it just ain't gonna fit into a kind of framework that we can slap, that we, we know is a Western framework. So it's interesting to hear about this and exciting. So, is it meaningful to anybody? But that's what I guess. Uh, what's the last part there? I said I don't know if that's meaningful to anybody, but that's what I guess. That's good. No, that's great. Okay. Let's take a deep breath and, um, Matt. <laughs> you want to start with Richard's question? Or yes, I think. Backwards we'll forward. go in order. I, I think in terms of transnational on the ground sort of uh, operations that are fusing the culture from the global. Uh, Speak up. Please. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so demure. Come on. Okay, so. Uh, um, Stand up. Stand up? Yeah. Okay. Do what you want to do. I think I'll do, okay, I want to sit down. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the reasons that we chose to meet here was because Double Edge is a fantastic example of that. But that's the easy answer to the question, to just point to Double Edge. Um, I, you know, I think one particular, it's almost, a, there's, there's a vernacular music movement happening right now. And one of the organizations which is doing a lot with that is the Association for Cultural Equity, which, um, the Alan Lomax archives is related to. And um, folks may have heard in the last, I think maybe it was two months ago, three months ago, the entire archive was digitized. It is absolutely open access. You can access every, you know, everything that Lomax recorded is available now uh, with, you know, it's free uh, and it's accessible. And what I think, you know, there, there are nuggets along the way where I think we see traditions being, being localized within that sort of vernacular arts movement where the same people who are working on Lomax, you know, are, are releasing West African acoustic music. And you're realizing that that music is linked to music from Mississippi Hill Country. And you're making those sorts of connections with the past and the present. You know, and there's exchange between those communities in ways that, um, you know, th these labels are doing. And I, I feel like that's almost, I mean, they don't call themselves that, but it's a form of social entrepreneurship that they're doing in terms of spreading culture uh, and, and increasing dialogue. And that's a large scale example of that. You know, I think it's happening. I mean, that has many community sort of application points. 
I mean, we have folks in the room who are, do, are doing this and are thinking about roadside theater as a place that comes to mind. It's thinking about those kinds of connections, too. Yeah, and that's good. It could just be one, like, sort of boom, boom, boom. I think the other thing, just a point of clarification, too, not to throw like too much into the mix, but, but you, 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 just, um, you just hit on this idea of global exchange. And that's particularly in the place that I'm interested in in that, in that question. Stephen. Thank you. Uh, I think, actually, um, I'd like to posit, uh, and, and this can be response to all of the four respondents, I, I think the uh, local food or slow food or food as conveyor of culture really addresses a, a lot of the things that, that I've heard from your remarks. Um, there is, you know, a, a renewed universal interest in where our food comes from and, and its meaning to us. And I think in an urban as well as rural context, um, you know, this is a universal language and it lends itself to storytelling. It lends itself to um, creation of community. I think there is enormous opportunity. It's decentralized. You know, it's not controlled by any one place, you know, the ubiquity of farmers markets, it's remarkable for those of us, you know, who travel around. It's an amazing movement and there's something delightful, right, to when you do travel and can go to a local market, you, you understand the place in a completely different way. I, th I think there's enormous opportunity for us to use even that platform alone with some of these other channels of sharing it that we can recreate the notion, uh, a lot of what we're saying about how to value one another's cultural backgrounds. And that, as we know, is a foundation piece to kind of understanding the kind of change and dialogue that needs to come about from that. So first thing that went into my mind was the, some of the exchanges that Apple Shop's involved in over the years, um, where we, we kind of described them as South-South ex, um, exchange, where it was really rural communities rural community in the U.S. exchanging with a rural community in China or in, in, in Indonesia and um, looking at what the common ground is and what the difference, you know, doing an exchange really from that perspective. The other one that came to mind, and I don't know if it's typically talked about this way, but I thought of um, a round table we had where there was a real connection between Native peoples who were at the round table and a gentleman from the um, Penn Center um, here in South Carolina, coming out of an African American and the legacy of slavery, and looking at um, the connection. And given that these were Native peoples from various sovereign nations, I would consider that as transnational as well. Sort of, um, and there was, it was a really powerful moment. Some of you guys were there, and when it was like um, the guy from the Penn Center said, "I hear your story. I've lived your story," um, to one of the Native presenters. Um, and really being able to connect on that level. Do you want us to answer the value question too, or um, your second question? Because I, what I would say really quickly on that is, I think some of the values of this work, as Steve said, was decentralized, I would say unidirectional. Like, it's not like there's a center when you're reaching out. Um, I, I would say that, it, um, it, that tension is a good thing, not a bad thing to be man, man, uh, managed. And just to kind of um, amen some of the things Elandria said that, you know, it's really about embracing the full histories and, and understanding and embracing them and um, the complicated identities um, in this work rather than trying to find some easy universal. Akita, would you like to respond to any or all? <laughs> um, sure, I'll just, uh, the. Richard, to your, I know your first question was directed to them, but I just, I couldn't help the immediate community um, in my, from where I'm from, the Hmong American community, um, refugee community, there's a large population in the Midwest and the Central Valley. I think they're doing incredible transnational work. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I, from what I have witnessed and listened to, a lot of it is around diasporic struggle and a struggle to survive, but I think this is an opportunity where we have, um, um, I'll speak as a privileged American citizen, to look to other people to follow them instead of me 
trying to invent things. Um, there's a great book of poetry called How Do I Begin that was just published last October. Um, po Hmong American poets, um, it's not necessarily all rural at all, but I think there's a lot of questions that are useful to coming up with um, uh, uh, strategies of survival and strategies of thriving that use art, and this particular example, poetry, as a way of honoring memories of rural living. Um, from my understanding, the Hmong American community, the Hmong community in Southeast Asia was almost entirely rural. So um, that was just, I'm excited to be able to share that. Um, and then to the question about values, I mean, this is again just grounded in my own experience. Um, but someone said the word scrappy. Um, I love that word. And to me, that is one of the strengths of rural communities. You know, it's, it's when. In my experience, you know, everybody, everybody is a little bit of a welder. Everybody, you know, does a li there's this sense of, because convenience is not a part of our life, that <laughs> scrappiness, I, I, I'm so actually energized by the recession and the moment that we are right now, <laughs> because I think it's a moment, I'm very serious, when rural sensibility of, I'm going to figure this out because I can't just call someone in, we should be turning to rural people right now. Um, so scrappiness is a value. I would like to add. Yeah, I think um, probably spinning off of Elandria's uh, question, um, I think, um, and you know, I come from from that that field, and you know, I've been with Carpet Bag. I visited Highlander. I worked there. Uh, my son was with you in a at a time so uh, I understand I understand somehow your question and I, I've been part of that type of organizing uh, thinking but uh, let me put my t-shirt of an uh, actor and uh, we need oh because what I want to say is that in order to play this game I want to I, I want to use the soccer as you know because it's part Argentina of, right, right. Uh, we need to identify our places in the field so, so that question is valid and is important, and I should keep it. But, but it, my, my, the real thing that I need to do is this thing about the irrational. So, we need those people that are going to go there. We need those people that are going to think these questions that are you thinking you are thinking about, and we need to work together. Now, this is the challenge. Um, I think we need to kind of like what um, is ma marionette, uh, Mar Mar yeah, yeah, marionette. Mar I pronounce poorly, but I think I agree with you, and I think we need to hold that uncertainty, which is part of this journey. To it, Odysseus didn't know where he was going. I didn't know that a war was about to happen. I didn't know that I was going to be, you know, in Asheville in 1996, or that you know that that thing happened with UT. Not true. We don't. We cannot predict everything. We cannot plan. And the poem says that that I that I use for for him, um, or for me. Uh, so, if we understand, so how do we deal with this together? This is the challenge, and probably this is the value. And also to keep in, I think I, we need to keep in mind that values keep changing. We cannot establish, but like the. Because reality keeps changing all the time, so so uh, something that is valid and the, the market explains. I mean, you know, everybody worships the market like the like the golden calf. The market is a reflection of us. It's like TV. It's a reflection. It's not it. We are different. And you know, we voted for this guy, but this but things had changed. So what are we gonna do now? And and we need to accept. So, uh, you know, I like the title, Crisis, uh, Change. Change and Opportunity, but I really like the Asian the adage that is crisis, danger and opportunity. <laughs> danger. So we are in danger, and we need to deal with it. So I think that that's kind of like, um, I didn't touch upon the agriculture, but I think I have something to say, but I'm not, not now. Respondents, um, did our panel answer, address your questions, concerns? Can I, can I jump in here just real quickly? Uh, because I think there was something interesting that happened with Donna 
Richard. And I think that's very important. The, the cultural element of this is, is very important. And I would just like to add, maybe to complicate that even further, one of the areas of dialogue, which at least I haven't seen a lot in the time that I've been, been watching it, is a dialogue you know, where we're thinking about these issues, but we, you know, we, we have folks from the local organic community, and we have folks from conventional agriculture. No, one, no, one, no one's here right now. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. OK, less demure. OK, um, <laughs> we, we need to put conventional farmers in a room with organic farmers and have a dialogue. I feel like and we can discuss this uh, you know, off, off of this as well, but you know, th I think there, there are portions of rural community which we're less comfortable dealing with if we're from a certain perspective. And we have to bring, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of conventional farmers who have a place in this dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, and we have to include them. So, pardon? No, sorry. No. Let's open this up. We have others, I know, that want to make comments or ask questions. So please, <laughs> raise your hand, feel free. Yes. Matthew, kind of in response to that, but any of you can speak to it. Um, Would you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Savannah Barrett. I'm from Kentucky and a graduate student in Community Arts at the University of Oregon. Um, I guess my question is, in working with Extension this summer, it seems that there's a vast opportunity at, within our reach and through Cooperative Extension because they're in almost every county in this country, right? And they have this history of working with agriculture and with industrial agriculture, but that's shifting in the community development and some of them are taking these fine art bents, I guess, in their programming. So how do you envision working with these, this organization and these groups of people that are already so embedded in the community. Yeah, I think maybe a lot of folks could, could get at that. I think maybe that, that the dialogue hasn't happened enough. I think maybe the, the place to start is that we're all people in a particular place, and we're invested in it, and we value it. And you know, moving forward from there towards a larger structure. I don't know if that, that, that's maybe, maybe a little bit general, but. Uh, I, just in my personal life, I, I have come to think of um, a, a politics of neighborliness as really essential. And I think this is where rural activism looks very different from urban activism. Because I came home from UC Berkeley really angry at, at a new, with new perspectives. Um, and I, I realized throughout time, though, that in rural settings, my neighbor who has a bumper sticker that says Obama is a socialist gets me out of um, jams when I get my four-wheel drive tractor stuck in the mud. <laughs> and there's a real reliance there. And I think this is where, I think maybe we're saying the same thing. But a politics of neighborliness, I think, forces us to engage in coalition in a way that is un might be uncomfortable but that it, 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 it has stakes in the long term. And I, I do think that, if I can go out on a limb, I think this is where the Occupy movement maybe fell short. Um, there's a, I understand the rage, and I think there has to be a space for rage, and I think that's particularly where art can come in. But there's also, a, we need to think on long timelines. We need to think of building, I, I, I don't care if this sounds corny, of loving, the people next door, including conventional ag, including people who I'm like, please don't spray, I want to go for a run. I mean, these people are my neighbors. Um, and I think, again, this is where rural, rural consciousness has a lot to offer um, activists in non-rural settings. I would also like to add to that one of the things. Can you identify yourself? Oh, my name is Rachel Reynolds Lester, and um, I'm a folklorist and work um, with food producers and artisans in my home county. And one of the things that I often point to is an economy of neighborliness. And again, I think uh, rural people or um, people connected with their places in, in rural America. Um, depend on one another in the way that you mentioned me. And in a lot of ways, in looking at how to supplement uh, the funding structures that are disappearing, 
I think that we have a wonderful model in the way that we deal with one another as neighbors in little places. Like you said, you depend on your neighbors to help you when you're in a jam. But also, there are all these um, alter ter alternative forms of capital that are available mm -hmm. um, in that system. So that people, like in my county, a quarter of the people live below the national poverty line. So um, we're going to try a Kickstarter campaign and hope that um, we can connect with people in a broader area in terms of raising money and, and in small amounts. But also, I've, I've been able to accomplish a lot in my community by people being willing to contribute their talents, um, their labor, their ideas as, as part of that membership um, within the community. And I think that that's a really good gathering point in supplemental system for our group. Thank you. Chris? I'm Chris Beck, work with the, the Department of Agriculture. Um, Stephen's comment about, I want to talk about funding a little bit, because I know we all, it's easy to forget some of what keeps a lot of this going. But you had talked about the declining funding and some of the new money is not supporting rural as much. And uh, part of my thinking in that is a lot of the new wealth that's been created are from people who are really focused on innovation and creative ways of doing things. And Nikki would use the word scrappy to remind us. And I think, and, and then you've all talked about how rural people, you know, we are scrappier. We have to bring everybody together. And I think that there's a, maybe a, a, some thought to be done around how in rural communities, the way we do things, the way we leverage our neighbors, uh, the way we're all, uh, plumbers and, and, and whatnot, those might be the very qualities that can appeal to some of the new wealth that's been created over the last 15 years. I don't know that we've done, I don't know we know how to connect to that and, and we could probably use some help thinking about that, but I, but I think there's a real opportunity to think about in terms of building a more durable uh, financial base for the work we all want to do and to to the extent that philanthropy, new philanthropy, can be a part of that, um, I think there's there's some good thinking that should be done. And just the fact we're in this room, in a town that has no cell phone reception, but we're broadcasting this conference to the rest of the world, uh, is interesting to me. And, and I think um, um, that there, I don't really have a point. I just I think that, that, that there's an opportunity there that we need to. To, to, to make and connect to that new group of people who made a little money, a lot of money, in the last uh, 15 years. It is a paradox, isn't it? It is, and... How about the cell phone service? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they love, they love paradox. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's the follow-up question. Yes. So just to piggyback, uh, and yes. I said that. Uh, <laughs> here's this question, which is, and this was pointed out earlier, about a need for a new type of philanthropy that you mentioned, Stephen. Yeah. And to me, getting to a, a concrete place, um, who here, how have you imagined a uh, new type of, because one of the things you're pointing to is infrastructure. How do we in, envision and implement a new type of infrastructure that embraces nodes of cross-sector collaboration, but in a larger way that connects to the, dis, that speaks to the disconnect between funding and service and concrete on the ground that it happens at times. Uh, I don't have the, the answers. I'm, we're looking at this a lot. There's some, there's some interesting things here. You know the, uh, the what was it, eBay billionaire? Uh, Jeffrey Skull and the Skull right. Foundation. And they, you know his notion of philanthropy, of course, is to unleash individual entrepreneurship. And in that sense, that's one of the things to mention, because it's different from that old philanthropy which said you hire a professional staff which understands the need areas of a sector you want to have influence in. And you know, in some ways, I think a lot of us have, who have been supported by old philanthropy have felt left behind by these new notions, you know? Like, uh, but I think in some sense, we can, use, we can use some of these new ideas. I do think entrepreneurship and, and the generation, this first generation of kind of uh, uh, coders and people who are creating these digital futures have 
given us amazing things like Kiva, you know, like ways to do micro investing. And I think there is always, there's a chance to reinvigorate that space with what we're talking about. So we just can't leave that off the table. I also want to mention, you know, uh, right next door to us in San Francisco is a small nonprofit called Code for America. And really, it's kind of like a, a peace core of digital activism. And it's where young, smart, uh, uh, talented people are willing to share that talent. And, and while they need is some specific you know, kind of call, and I do think we have uh, uh, plenty of, of, of questions and needs to put before them. Uh, another thing that's happening a lot you may have heard of is a hackathon, which is kind of this a way that you invigorate a community of young you know, digital geeks, uh, gearheads, but, but who want to be in a space and you work on an issue, like for an all-day session, of inventing, um, you know, an application or a game or a way to utilize social media to address a real social problem. And I think each and all of these can give us uh, a lot of opportunities here. Thank you. Yes. Um, Karma from Pilgrim Theater. I live here in Nashville, and I'm intrigued, as I often am, by some of Carlos's comments, and I want to try to formulate an observation about Double Edge's work, but on the way to doing that, I want to mention a figure who I think is really key in, in theater, in terms of thinking about what Carlos was talking about at the Irrational, but also in terms of direct social action, which is lots of Havel. Not very rural, but uh, if you read Havel's plays, they're complete absurdist theater. And on the other hand, they're simply autobiography of someone testifying to having lived in an absurd social situation. He also became involved in direct action, first of all, as one of the architects of the Velvet Revolution, and then daring to become the president of his country and to enter into a sphere where you can't practice the irrational every day as president of your country. This means you have to enter into compromise. You have to accept compromise. You have to accept uh, a lot of giving up of your ideals to function and have direct uh, results from your actions. I think that's a compromise between the rarefied sphere of, of art in the purest sense and, and the experience of direct action. My observation is that I really have felt for a long time that the aesthetic mission of Double Edge is to protect a space for the irrational. Uh, in the face of a lot of social forces that want to compel art to make sense, to have a direct consequence, to mean this to that audience, define your audience, tell us what it is you want to say to your audience, <coughs> then come and make a, a play that says that to that audience. Well, that's pretty straightforward and linear, but it's not really, I think, what the aesthetic <coughs> of the Double Edge is. But then at the same time, in a practical sense, Double Edge is involved in this economy of neighborliness which I think is a really important idea emerging from this conversation. So you, you can be Don Quixote in the Don Quixote negotiating with your neighbors on a daily basis. So there's I'll say the irrational <laughs> relates to the sacred Would you as say well. The, 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 the irrational relates to the, to, to the sacred all the time unless no. you remove yourself completely from society and become a monk, which although sometimes people make that mistake. <laughs> um, if you're going to live in the world, you have to accept that you are sacred, but then you return to the earth again. And that's, I think, in those moments of economy of neighborliness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott. Maybe. No. <laughs> Scott. Development and leadership education. And I'd like to come back to that word that you drew. Me to a different place. My wife is a quilter. That are stitched together. They represent a recycling of, of already used material. They have borders. Each individual piece has its own design, but creates a much larger design when put together. What concerns me when we start talking about national strategies or global 
things is that we lose the focus on the individual scrap and create a quilt that is just one piece of material, which is not a quilt. Um, and, and, and so, it, again, it's, a, it's holding two things at, together at the same time. Uh, and, and a quilt does that. It creates a large picture that is global with a lot of individual detail. If you look at one scrap, it can be really elaborate. Um, and, and I think that that is our challenge during this session or during the next two days is to come up with, think nationally, but from an individual. Thank you. Catherine, you had your hand Yeah, I just wanted to share an example of this politics of neighborliness. And Serena, you helped me with this. Um, called Cure, Clean Up Our River Environment. And they've just put together over the last couple of years of uh, uh, Minnesota River Valley, Lake Pepin. So they invited the uh, big ag and then organic farmers and the environmental watershed uh, down to Lake Pepin, which is filling up with silt because of the practices of the farming. And then they, the farmers invited and to see how they're farming or how they care for the land. So the idea is to start a dialogue instead of a worked. And so we've had numbers of conversations now down the river. We, the Bush Foundation, have been helping by helping to support the convening folks and what kind of facilitation you need to do that kind of work, which is not. Uh, so I just want to, and we're also seeing that now happening with Native Americans around violence, around youth, that there's a friendship committee forming where people are starting to talk to each other differently. It's really critical. Um, one, two, three. Yes, Me? yes. My name is Dana Wild. I'm an artist and I live in Williamsburg. And the thing that's on my mind right now is about, the, did, Carlos, did you bring up the danger? Is that what you? So there's a thing I think about all the time, and I'm not the only person who thinks about this. Uh, but it's important to me, it's, it's hiding in the shadows of the, <laughs> the whole conversation. Like, uh, we're, we're in a minority all together here in that we agree that. Um, creativity and art are important. And so, <laughs> so when I hear about kind of the emergency of, of the different kinds of arts funding that are, that are disappearing, that's of course really of no surprise because culturally, and not just in the US, just really most places, um, creativity, self-expression, risk-taking, these are not valued. In fact, they're discouraged. the things that are valued in our economy. Just like, it's just, that's not how most of us are in um, So it, it seems really important that we have to think about ways to change culture, just. <laughs> but the whole, the fact that, that creativity is not valued and it's, it's often educated out of us in a variety of ways. Already know a, a leader and a key person who writes and speaks on this topic is Ken Robinson. He's the one who did uh, one of the more famous TED. It's one of the best talks you'll see in your life. So, but to me, that like that is stuff. That's that's me. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. It's very. Farm in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, neighbors, neighborliness. It's, it, it's, I find it very comforting to find out that that's become very much a part of this conversation and, and maybe even a, a, a solution. And I want to share, I guess, uh, a mode of communication that we've learned. We, 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 uh, 
we are from Chicago originally. We've been there almost 20 years now, so we, we almost forget that now. We, and we're reminded whenever we go to a big city and find out how ill-suited we are for life on, uh, on the streets. Uh, but uh, I think one of the biggest shocks was how, how what, a, what, a, what a critical role neighbors play in our lives. I mean, this is from the very first day when we, the moving van dropped in, dropped in, yeah, and stuck in a ditch, and, and uh, people we'd never met before showed up the next morning with their tractors and, and, and yanked it out. It wasn't, it wasn't really easy. But there, there, there's this way that, uh, this contrasting ways of, of communicating uh, potential action that, that we've noticed between our, our urban friends and our rural friends. And when we, we bought this farm, and, and people would come up and they say, you know what you should do? You ought to have a and b or you ought to do this, or you ought to do that. And it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, OK. But we, uh, however, the, the, our, our neighbors would never, ever tell us what we should do. What, what they would do in the most roundabout and, and most supportive way is what a fellow could do. It, it's, it, it, it's, it's somewhat maddening at times because we, I tell the story, and Donna's heard this so many times, and she might roll her eyes. But if I wanted to buy hay from a neighbor, I could, and I, I knew he had it. I need 200 bales. How much is it? That that that's that's not that's not the way it works. That's that that would be rude. You would have to go and talk about the weather and talk about. Then and then it would come around to if a fellow were looking to get some hay. Well, fellow, you know, and so it was really <laughs> wonderful. I've described it as a kabuki, but it's a very ritualized interaction. But it does have its downsides. In <laughs> on fire, <laughs> they they might suggest what a what a fellow might do. <laughs> so, when uh, like organic and conventional farmers together, I mean, we 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 deal. Is convert any of my neighbors. I mean, they're, they're all conventional farmers. They all perform atrocities, on and they're doing it productively, and they're working. You know, homesteads. You know, mowed putting green close up to all the buildings, and our ramshackle farm looks 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 abandoned. So, I mean, we, we don't we don't want to tell people what they should do. You know, we, we, can, we can do what we do, we can provide an example we, through our persistence and our scrappiness, and, and we, we can show what's possible, but we, we don't want to tell them, you know, tell anyone what, what they should do. Right? And that, I mean, I'm talking about neighbors, I'm not talking about people in the room. But if, you're, if you're city folks, feel free to, to dictate activity, uh, but if you're from the country, it works better to, to, to suggest in the most roundabout way a, a potential course of action. Mark. Thank you. I'd like to respond to the, 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 uh, the neighborliness economy or the scrappiness and, and maybe challenge it or complicate it a little bit. Um, and, and I'll give two examples of something, and I, I, I appreciate it and enjoy uh, that sense of neighborliness. I work at Roadside Theater at, at Apple Shop in, in Whitesburg, Kentucky, and that's one of the things that I think I would not be able to live without, um, that sense of connectedness and working together. Um, so we have institutions, a venerable one in our part of rural America in quite a lot of places, the volunteer fire departments and ambulance services. Um, and it's born out of necessity and, and it's a part of the, I think the fundamental uh, reality of, of civilization is that we simply have to work together to put out fire. Um, and and uh, that should be celebrated. And, uh, and a newer example, uh, working in broad uh, is uh, community organizations working together to figure out how broadband could be used to link uh, uh, rural um, And that, that is also something that should be celebrated as a, a triumph of technology. But I think if we, if we only lift those up as a positive example, if we run the the fact that it's more dangerous and your quality of, of health care is still never uh, as it is in an urban area uh, unless policy changes. Uh, so I think uh, there's a real risk celebrating the things that are, that are actually
And, and that's why, I mean, I think, uh, I, I think this is a, uh, an exciting time, but also a very troubling time. Um, and, and there are real issues facing rural America, uh, addiction, uh, over-incarceration, uh, and uh, debt, medical bankruptcy, and student debt in particular. Um, and if our conversations about how helping young people uh, stay in our communities uh, only focus on the neighborliness aspects of it, I think it will be easy for us to lose track of the reality that uh, unless something changes uh, in, in an economic system that's uh, creating an enormous amount of profit from student debt, it's going to be impossible, the debt that can't be discharged in bankruptcy, it's going to be impossible for young people that don't come from affluent backgrounds to work in rural areas. So I, that's, that's why I say that, that we should celebrate the neighborliness, because I think that's the root of the, the, some, a lot of the rural arts. Um, but I, I think if we're not producing art that really speaks to the important social issues that we're facing in our, in our democracy now, um, one, it's not going to be relevant, but two, uh, as artists, we're going to continue to be marginalized and, uh, and uh, that funding, uh, the fun funding is somewhere in the center that I had in mind this would come to funding in a closer way, but, but I, I just, I want the things we've had to do to get by. Um, so some of that ha has to change. Uh, Thank you, Mark. Very good. And uh, finally, Alondria. So it's me and then there's somebody back here that needs to say. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> so, so there are three quick things because I think it's really important. Of me when we talk about transnational, to not lift up the Philippines um, because I think it's the, one of the yeah, so and like how it's happening in terms of indigenous cultures and going cross. Art and struggle and, and movement theater and movement practices cross nations. Like you always go home. You may come back to where you go, but you must go home. You must go back. And there's this amazing, amazing way of connection that I think a lot of people are learning from and are trying to like all these movements around like how do you connect cross? Um, and so I would lift that up original form and funding circles are the original form of it's not new it's old and it's really time for us to go back to say how did we as a people regardless of where you ourselves because people that don't and it's not problem industrial complex is alive for a reason like where I worked was not a nonprofit, it became a nonprofit, and we're actually not moving in the same way because you were dependent upon the very people that you were trying to transform. And so we must talk about that. The third thing is that neighborliness is beautiful. And I agree, I can talk to my neighbor about UT football. And at the same time, they're trying to kill me. Um, literally. Um, and run me off the road. And so I live in a rural place where People are being shot, like next door people are being shot for doing videos about Mount Tower removal. So like we have to really hold that for indigenous communities, for poor white communities, and places where people are fighting against struggling using art to actually make a statement, it is not just, oh, I love you, you're so nice. And it may be beautiful here, I don't know, I don't live here. But in some places, neighborliness is not going to cut it. And you actually have to stand up in a different way. And I think I just it's a hard thing to hear all of this and not and not have a, like neighborliness is not the same. And there's a different sense of economic infrastructure that must be built by people that are really most directly impacted by these things. If we're actually and culture the way it's it'll be status quo and dominant. So if we don't move past a status quo dominant dialogue, then we run the risk of having the and it'll look the same. And so please, that's my hope, is to really push yourself outside of that because if you come in looking like everybody, and you, then they're gonna be like, come on down. And if you don't, then it's like, don't be a uh, David Martinez, uh, Media Literacy Project. Um, I think Alondra kind of uh, uh, 
points I would like to make. Uh, something that we and this young lady were talking about this morning over breakfast was the concept of you spoke about um, long timelines. Also coming into this conversation yesterday with the word rural as you and then Matt's uh, uh, a rural being uncomfortable to look at. Something that we had talked about yesterday was and, and, and promote art that was accessible to everybody. But if my people need to worry about how their next meal is going to come about, I ain't going to be worrying about putting on plays or making colored pencil drawings. Um, also, something that Carlos said, um, the idea of the word acceptance kind of reminds me of the word assimilation, which is something that I don't agree with. But finally, something that Stephen said, that me being responsible for my own representation is something that also was needed with me. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, I ask you if you would like to have um, a closing comment, brief, final thought. Final thought. M maybe one, just one more metaphor. I mean, there's a lot that hopefully we, we can talk about, you know, after this. We were talking about the Occupy movement, and one of the things that, that interested me about that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I need a personal megaphone. Um, no, but, but is uh, the hope, the hope another metaphor, it's a commons in the agricultural sense of the word, where people can meet and, and people from all different and ideologies can cross this path and talk to each other. Um, that's just a metaphor. I'm just, I'll leave it at that. That's just a metaphor to think about how we craft. Um, I just want to hold this electricity in the air right now. Um, I love the pushback. I love the challenge. I don't think anyone, there is one answer, but I, I, what Carla said, I think uncertainty to me is really invigorating. So I just, I don't even want to say anything else. For a second. Uh, one second. Or not, you can download it. It's free if you have <laughs> smartphones. Go to the iTunes store. Filipino or not. Uh, I just want to say also, um, as one who doesn't live in and, and, and feels like a privileged visitor, I um, love the idea that it's in this realm that we all believe in that social change is possible and we do here when it's uh, understood through cultural change. And when people realize that they have connections, they have a new way of thinking, a new way to access one another uh, through, through art and through stories, uh, that it's a beautiful thing. So I'm all stirred up, <laughs> too, and um, a lot of stuff here. But I guess what's going through my mind right now is what, who do we mean when we say we? And uh, there are many we's in the room. and. Um, also, the kind of push and pull of individual relationships and structural and historical ones and where they bump into each other and where they support each other. Um, I think I want to complicate the way urban's been described um, and um, the dichotomies, and I want to bring the word solidarity into the room. Um, I think there's a lot of solidarity in urban neighborhoods. Um, uh, uh, many of which um, I work in, where a lot of people come from rural backgrounds and have many similar struggles, and that we tend to stereotype urban as well. And I think we need to look at where our points of connections are and our. I think it's important to include the word because of the observations and the remarks, it's important for, at least for myself, to remember that this is a very part interaction that we have with each other. So when I hear 
David's comment about what I said, is, ah, did I say that? Um, and it is important in that case. I also think that it's important that we all have different kinds of them to the table. So these meetings, in order for them to project into the action and to the future, maybe I'm jumping ahead into the next meeting that we're going to have, I, I want to remind myself and I want to maybe offer this to you and to you. So maybe whatever I said is not exactly what I am not afraid of that. Uh, in my way of expressing. But um but I think uh if we if we can get into the, we we need to we need time to understand each other, to bring all these issues the soccer example, we each one should play in the, in the best position we play. It's complementary, right? Because we're in a team. That if, we can, if we can hone into that, then I think we have an option, a possibility, an opportunity to, to, to develop the movement that we're looking into. This panel has not been an attempt to answer much, but to give a reflection and a thought. And these panelists have all given a lot of thought to what they said today about their perspective, about their beliefs, about their experience. So it's offered to you as our audience, offered to you as this working group to stimulate and encourage and challenge our thinking for the next two days as we try to build a movement. And just in reflection from your comments and the respondents and your comments, it's and there are many pointed out to the team. Because within the paradox, a paradox is difficult to hold within one hand. Understood. So perhaps instead of looking at the differences, what we do try to see is a way in which all of us can manifest and values and find within that a team that can play together change things for rural communities and artists and cultural workers in this country and around the world. About everything. We are never going to agree about all the food we eat. I mean, just an example over the last couple of days, look at the diversity of food, the double-edged desires and our needs. But we have all been able to sit at the same time. I would just close by challenging us and asking us to think in those terms, not about our differences, but about our neighborliness, about our struggle and our vision and our dreams and our craziness and our pain. And know that ultimately this group, our working hypothesis is that we're going to assume the positive. Okay? Thank you so much. I'm going to let Matthew Glassman uh, conclude us here. And uh, Matthew, you know. Yes. And by just one Thank you. Very much. Be patient. I just want to acknowledge some of the people that have made today and this weekend possible. So if you can listen uh, attentively to this, I'll be grateful. Um, and also, there were some uh, online activity. Thank you to the people online. Um, Dev Platt from Chicago has uh, wrote some great um, thoughts about how identity plays into this, and we'll be including that into the next stages of our work. So thanks, Dev, for taking part, um, and those of you tweeting the nuggets of wisdom that have been, been uh, coming out of this. Um, conversations have been going on since two uh, of double edge and Philip Arnaud. Um, 
Um, so you should go online and see the archives of these conversations um, that, uh, that, we, that we've been doing since 2009, Art and Place, Rural Voices, and Philip, and uh, we're very proud that that work and that conversation is continuing today and evolved like this. So thank you, Philip. Um, Everyone at HowlRound. HowlRound is the journal of uh, the theater commons. Um, oh, uh, incredible new arena for thinking and philosophy around theater and sustainability and art making. Um, I would like to acknowledge today we also have Representative Stephen Kulik, um, who has been a longtime champion of the arts and culture, uh, as well as the rural communities here in the Commonwealth. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I'd love to take a moment to thank the, the folks in the organizations and foundations that have been supporting this. Um, a big thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts for supporting this convening and for being here in person. That means a lot. Um, to the New England Foundation for the Arts as well. Um, of course, the Center for Rural Strategies, not only as a co-convener, but as a, a, a sponsor and a major partner in this. Uh, the Bush Foundation, thank you very much. Um, Greenfield Community College, and Leo Juan Carlos is here, who's been a leader of uh, cross-sector partnerships, deep thinking, and leadership of, of rural arts and culture in the Franklin County. Um, and Greenfield Community College, which is a local community college, which has had a, a major cut from their, bu their budget, still came through as a, a major supporter of this, this community. We're very grateful. Um, arts and Democracy Project, uh, and Americans for the Arts also. Um, supporters of and sponsors of this and partners. Um, and now a list that you'll have to bear with me is our, our local business and restaurant partners. A lot of this food has been grown and made locally and contributed and donated uh, because of their belief. So whether or not you're local, go to these places and thank them. They need to know, they need to feel acknowledged and have your patronage there. The Brass Buckle in Greenfield, Arise, exclamation point, Farm to Table Pizzeria in Amherst, Hope and Olive in Greenfield, The People, River Valley Co-op, Shelburne Falls Coffee Roasters, Bread Euphoria, The Brewmaster's Tavern, Shelburne Falls Wine Merchant, Dean's Beans Coffee, Mesa Verde, Greenfield, Deals and Steals Market, and Greenfield's Market in Greenfield. Um, Thank you to all of them. Yay. There's a full list that includes the local B&Bs that have given us discounts everywhere. And thank you all for being a part of today's conversation. Um, I need to ask you, we're going to have a meal all together now. I need to ask you to leave first. <laughs>